Okay, everybody. Yeah. Not that I really need this, but you know, gives it the extra authority. Yeah, gets people going. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, this is a real family affair today. I like it. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Varley, and I am the creator of a website called everythingiseverything.myc. It is the... <laughs> Most extensive, okay, definitive, I don't think you can claim your own thing being definitive. It's the most extensive bagel survey that there is in New York City, over 200 bagel stores across all five boroughs. Uh, and I am going to tell you a little bit about it today. But in order for me to tell you a little bit about it today, I have to actually take one step back to give you the context of how it is that uh, I came to be in such a unique, blessed position as to review all these bagel stores in New York City. So. Let's begin. Uh, Highly Varlet is the creative moniker that is shared by myself and my wife, Jessie Hyatt. And so uh, as far as my background, I've done any number of different creative things. I have done uh, music, I've done mixed media art, I've done video games, I've done writing. Uh, basically, if uh, you can document it in some creative fashion, I've done it. Uh, my wife, Jessie, on the other hand, who's here today, fortunately, yeah. Uh, she is an artist in her own right. She handles primarily textiles, so uh, she has a studio in Bushwick where she does fabrication and dyeing of garments for different fashion companies. And she's got a whole team, and she manages them, and they're awesome. If you're looking to have some sort of uh, garments done in some fashion, uh, you can talk to her, maybe she can help you out. Um, but. We create together under this moniker, Highly Varlet, and we did this project called 2020 Total Clarity. And 2020 Total Clarity was epic. It was a project where we walked five marathons a week for one calendar year around the streets of New York City. So that's 7,000 miles total. Uh, we went, you know, from Fort Totten in Queens to the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, uh, to Cafe Wa. We walked in all weathers. You can see Jesse there is covered in snow. That was the day of the blizzard. Uh, if you recall last uh, February 2021, where it snowed, the most it snowed in like eight or 10 years. Um, we were out there walking. It was, uh, it was quite an experience. It, uh, it was good that we had already been walking for about six months, because otherwise we probably would have passed out in a snowbank somewhere. But, uh, we managed to do it. It was an amazing experience. And this whole thing could be one talk itself. It could be an hour plus. Uh, but we're here to talk about bagels. We're not here to talk about that. If you are interested in that, I would recommend going over to HighlyVarlet.com and seeing all the content we have there. We did a podcast every week. Uh, we carefully curated all of our clothing. Each season we had five outfits apiece. Uh, so we spent a lot of time and consideration uh, documenting it as it was happening. We're still documenting uh, to this day. And uh, one of the other documentations, obviously, was the bagels. But one last thing before we get to the bagels. We got married. On the last day of the project, we walked a marathon and then decided to get married at the end of it. So we invited our friends. Whoever wanted to walk a portion of it could walk a portion with us. We walked through Prospect Park, up to Bushwick, had kind of a midday reception. And then we started walking again back down through Prospect Park and ultimately to Marine Park, where we got married in the park. If you've ever been to Marine Park, I recommend going to Marine Park. It's a really cool plot. Um, also, the great thing about planning your own wedding is that you can rewear the clothes. So. <laughs> so, we're here now at the end of the walk, the fastest version possible of that. Why bagels? Well, there are a few reasons why bagels, right? Um, it's the perfect walking food. You can pick it up and uh, you know, hold it in your hand. It's not like super messy. Uh, it's portable, it's quick, it's cheap, uh, and you can find it everywhere in New York City. So uh, that's great. And it's also um, like a carbo load. You know, it really keeps your energy up uh, when you're out walking a marathon, 26.2 a day. It's also a lifelong love. I uh, grew up on Long Island in Huntington. Uh, Long Island is a great place for bagels as well. I'm not going to get into that fight about where's better. 
But um, you know, there was a bunch of stores in, in Huntington. I always preferred Super Bagel um, over the other stores. Always established preferences. When I moved into the city, my first apartment, uh, there were several spots around me. I always walked a couple extra blocks to go to the better spot. Um, I've always had these preferences. Uh, I've uh, always been interested in figuring out why one is better than the other. Uh, I've always probably been slightly annoying to people about expressing those opinions, but uh, I never documented it until uh, something like this. Uh, a unique position. So I figured as pretty early on, like two weeks in or so, uh, we were at Utopia Bagels, which is actually uh, one of the stores represented today. Um, I started thinking to myself, you know, it would be really cool to do this, and the reason it would be so cool to do this is because I'm in every neighborhood. We're going to be walking every neighborhood in New York City. I don't think anybody else has really ever had this opportunity before. If they even endeavored to do something like this, it would take triple the time that it took me. Uh, because when you're going on weekends, and then you're going to find a way to get out there uh, to the Bronx or to Staten Island, um, with us, what we were doing already, it, just, it was something that just locked in. And when you have nine and a half hours every day walking around the city, uh, you are doing a lot, but you're also not doing a lot. So you can start filling in your day with different activities, and, and this is what I started doing. Um, it's also the ultimate New York City food, right? I mean, you could argue that pizza might be, uh, but pizza's kind of ubiquitous at this point. It's, it's you know, global, or at least American. And, uh, you know, I could go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and there might be a decent pizza place. Pretty sure there's not going to be a good bagel place there, right? Like, we still own, like, the bagel supremacy uh, in most respects. And uh, also the fact that, you know, it has this deep Jewish heritage, which is tied very much to the city as well. Um, it really was the type of food that I wanted to be documenting while doing this project that was so much about New York City. So, the review criteria, now that we have the why, what were the ground rules for the project? So, I needed to have a control. I needed to get the same thing. I couldn't be getting a uh, boysenberry bagel with funfetti cream cheese at one spot and, you know, like an egg sandwich at another on a cinnamon raisin. I, I needed to get the same thing so that there would be some semblance of, like, uh, consistency. So I landed on an everything with scallion and cream cheese. Um, happens to be one of my favorite bagels, but it also does a couple of things. Um, one, it's a, you know, probably top five most popular orders. So if you're reading the review about that, uh, you're gonna get a sense of what the store is like. But also, it gives the store a little bit of ability to demonstrate their intentionality, uh, demonstrate their creativity. So, you know, what are the toppings gonna be? It's probably going to be poppy, sesame, garlic, onion. Uh, probably going to be salt, but not always salt. And then you start getting into the alternative toppings. You know, is there going to be oat? Is there going to be sunflower? Is there going to be flaxseed? My personal favorite, caraway seed. Uh, that only was two stores in New York City, funny enough. Uh, but it is my favorite still. Uh, what's the density on the bagel? Is it, is it dense? Is it meant to be a showcase for the toppings? Or is it meant to just kind of complement the actual inherent nature of the bagel? As far as the scallion goes, right? How thick is the chunk on the scallion? Is it like eraser sized and uh, like, is it about texture or is it more like finely minced and about the flavoring and the coloring? Uh, all of these things give me an indication of what the store's intentionality is, how creative it is, how much it's considering what it's actually doing. And uh, you know, I don't know if you would be surprised, or you wouldn't be surprised, but like there are just tons of stores that just mail it in or they just, you know, they figure, this other store does it, so I'm just going to do that too, and, and that's that. Um, it's really uh, showing me those little, those little touches of consideration that will immediately make a store stand out. As far as the scoring criteria, pretty, I settled pretty early on to doing a 0 to 5 scale of store, spread, and bagel. So bagel and spread, it's pretty you know, common sense, right? You're eating that, so obviously you want to review it. The store may be a little less intuitive, but it's no less important. Uh, with the store, it sets the table entirely for the experience. You know, Immediately, if you walk in and you smell good bagels, wow. I mean, you're probably going to be in a good spot because it means that they're cooked on site, and it's probably been pretty recently since they've uh, cooked it. In addition to that, things like 
what the order flow is like. If it's a mess, you know, that's a pain in the ass. Uh, ideally, like, you get a bagel in 30 seconds. Sometimes you could just say everything with scallion cream cheese and not say another single word to a person, have the bagel in 30 seconds, and it is the most gratifying experience possible. Um, you know, what's the signage like? What music is playing overhead? All of these things contribute to the experience so that when I'm leaving the store, I'm either feeling good or I'm feeling a little annoyed about whatever's going on. And then as far as the amount, I set myself a goal of three a week for one calendar year. I did that so that if I, uh, you know, wouldn't, so I wouldn't fall behind, basically. So I wouldn't have to get to a point where I was catching up and eating too many bagels in one week. So much in the same way, I set five marathons a week for myself. You know, three bagels a week was the, the goal. Um, I did end up having to eat way more bagels than I would have liked at the end. We'll get to that in a second. Um, as far as the rubric here, so at the bottom, you can see this on the About section of the website, uh, but it gives you a sense of like what the actual scoring means. So anything that's a three or below, uh, it's not up to New York City standards, as mentioned here. Um, that doesn't, I mean, generally, yeah, it's probably not going to be good in another city also, but to give you a, a larger frame of reference, a 2.5 is what I would consider a grocery store bagel, like a lender's bagel. So if it falls below that, you're really in trouble in New York. Uh, three to four, uh, a passable store experience. Uh, it might have like something that's really good about it, but then it's dragged down by other areas, or maybe it's just flat across the board. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong about these stores. I've definitely gotten some emails from stores that are not happy that they got in the beige category, uh, which whatever, I get it, it's your store. You, you wanna expect that you're better than that. But with these cases, in, instead of the red ones, like that probably might be the best store in another town. It's just that you're dealing with the standards of New York City where it's just so much higher. So I don't think there's any real shame in it, but I understand you wanna get a score that you can tout. As far as a green bagel, four and above, this is something that's like a high quality experience. You'd be happy to live near there if you're near there. Uh, this could even be the best bagel for you. Uh, we'll get to this later, but ultimately, you know, all of this is a subjective thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking to claim that whatever I think is the definitive version, but uh, a four or above, yeah. I mean, it, it has enough uh, uniqueness to it that you could bring somebody from out of town and uh, you know, not, be, not be disappointed uh, in what you're providing them. And then we have the award section. So the, the yellow icon indicates anything that bagels, stores, or cream cheeses of note. And there are 15 a piece of all of those. So like 45 different awards for, uh, for doing uh, those things well. And then of course the black icon uh, represents best in borough. So, you know, there are five of those, uh, one for each borough. And they are the best of the best as far as these subjective rankings go. Uh, initial review totals. So I did 146 walking reviews. Again, I started a couple of weeks into the actual walking project. So I managed to hit the three week uh, pace pretty well. I put all those 146 on a map and I wasn't satisfied with the coverage. I felt like if I was going to make any claim remotely to the idea that it is a definitive bagel survey of New York, I couldn't go to war with something like that, I'd be crucified. So. What I did in September of 2021, a couple months after the walking component ended, I went to 56 bagel stores in one month. I can tell you right now, never do that. That is entirely too many bagels. Uh, I was eating in sometimes six or seven bagels a day. Uh, it, the scallion with the onion and the heaviness of the bagel, I, it was harder than walking a marathon, to be completely honest. Uh, and I had kind of said to myself like, oh, I only need like to eat half of them maybe, but I couldn't. Every time I get through half the bagel, I was like, I don't know enough about this bagel. I need to continue eating the whole thing. And so I would eat the whole thing and uh, I would feel awful. So don't ever do that. Don't eat 56 bagels in one month. Uh, so yeah, the project launched with 202 total bagels. Uh, since then it's grown to 214. I periodically add them, not with the same fervor, uh, but as people send me emails, I add uh, their store requests to a list, and you know, once a month or so, I'll continue to add it. So it's like slowly, organically continuing, uh, but not at the same fevered pace as uh, the initial launch. 
And uh, just to give you a sense of what like my notebook looks like as I'm going around, here are the notes along with like just the little, you know, if it's an awarded thing or not. You can see here a little poppy seed, a little sesame seeds. Because uh, I, I didn't even know this. I, I was opening the notebook the other day. I was like, oh my god, all these pages have everything toppings in all of them. Uh, but you know, I'm eating the bagel on, on top of the notebook and I'm writing as I'm going, so it's pretty funny. All right, so building the site. So now we have all the data. How are we building the site? So this is the first major site I've ever built. I've done you know, personal uh, websites, uh, but I've never really done something that would draw a lot of traffic or have any intention to draw a lot of traffic. Um, I thought it was going to take three months. It ended up taking eight. And uh, I can only lay claim to the design aspect of this. Uh, as far as like the front end and the back end building elements, uh, that'd be a gentleman named Todd Ohanian. Uh, he's fantastic. I can't recommend him enough. If anybody is looking to build sites, uh, they don't have the experience, but they think they have an idea of what they want to do. Todd was excellent in taking my uh, designs and translating them for what's possible. Uh, we spent a lot of time going back and forth. He was very patient, and uh, I can't speak highly enough about him. Um, as far as like the design philosophy of it, um, the way that I look about it is uh, where earnesty meets absurdity. So it's the earnestness of the task of like collecting all these reviews of you know spending an hour and a half writing each one of them of really reflecting on what makes something different and you know it can be hard to think about how this average bagel is different from the other average bagel um, but you know ultimately you come up with your own criteria you come up with like uh, is this an absent thing or is this a present thing um, so you take all that and then you acknowledge the absurdity of reviewing 202 bagels in New York City. I mean, it's absolutely a preposterous task. And to like kind of have that wink and the nod, the playfulness of all of that, to like go so deep with the data, but also recognize like this is, this is a fun thing. It's an enjoyable thing. Um, and as far as the aesthetic of it, it's uh, something I call contemporary web 1.0. And by that, I mean, if you remember the, the aughts of the internet, the 2000 to 2000, six or so. Uh, you may recall that like the blog era, there were no advertisements on these sites. There were no uh, like, share, subscribe, you know, uh, widgets. There was nothing really trying to draw your attention away from what was happening. It was more about what's the content, let me provide that content in a compelling way, let me not get in the way of the user's experience. Um, and that's what I was looking to do with this. You can see on the website there are no ads. Uh, there's very minimal uh, like social uh, uh, functionality to it. It's really just about the data and enjoying that experience. So with the fact that there's no advertisements, uh, there had to be a way around that as far as financing it, because it, it does cost money to host uh, the site. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later, but it's, uh, it was definitely a problem that had to be addressed. So here's a site. This is uh, the page you land on. Uh, it starts with the map. Um, my intention with the map was to have uh, a thing that, I mean, worked with the functionality and uh, the intuitiveness of Google Maps, uh, but didn't necessarily look immediately like Google Maps. So of course it is a Google Maps skin, uh, but it is uh, something that you know transcends kind of your typical, like I'm just using this to get to the subway type thing. Uh, if you, you know, again, it has all the functionality. You can zoom in, you can click on any one of the icons, and it'll pull up uh, one of these pop up boxes here. And uh, you can see this is Essa Bagel, another one of the stores here today. Uh, the pop up box will show you where the store ranks in Manhattan, where it ranks in the whole city, if it has uh, an award, so like Bagel a Note, uh, the store score, the bagel score, the spread score, a little pull quote from the full review the ability to get directions from whatever device you're uh, browsing, and uh, the ability at the bottom to go to the full review. And then when you go to the full review, uh, you'll see uh, you know, the full written review. Uh, I won't you know, read through the whole thing because it'll take too long, but I, I would say that it is uh, a really meaningful part of the whole experience is uh, the degree to which everything is elaborated upon. Uh, I've been gratified to receive a lot of positive feedback from stores that are like, hey, you know, the reason I like your thing 
is because you're not just saying thumbs up, thumbs down. You're like actually giving a reason for why it is that this is failing or succeeding. And uh, coming from uh, places where oftentimes it'll just be influencers not giving a reason but making like stupid faces and doing this, you know, I think it, uh, it's gratifying for them. And uh, in turn, it makes me feel good. So yeah, uh, there's that. And then at the bottom, you'll see uh, the different matrices. So this will show bagel size and texture, seed and salt density, spread ripeness, store style. So for instance, this is Leo Bagels and uh, Fidei, which is a great store. Um, you, can get the, you can see the bagel there is like on the extra large side, and it's a more crackly shell, less doughy. Uh, similarly, it's a store, it's like a contemporary store with focused services, which means it's mostly just about the bagels and that's it. Um, you can take that for just a single bagel, and then if you go to the top of the stats page, you'll see every store in the city and where each bagel falls within that uh, continuum. So it, uh, it allows you, if you spend some time just staring at it like a magic eye, some patterns start to emerge. Like for instance, an easy one to look at, bagel size. You notice how huge New York City bagels have become in you know, the century or so of their evolution. Um, in general, like, yeah, just big beefy bagels. And then uh, some of the smaller ones, you'll know they, they kind of do kind of the older style. Um, Staten Island, in fact, like uniformly just massive bagels for some reason. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of interesting information that you can extrapolate from here, as well as like where the awarded stores are relative to like the, um, the scattershot patterns. Pretty interesting. As far as the bottom of the stats page, uh, you can, we have basically an Excel-like uh, spreadsheet set up where every store is listed. You can sort by total score, store score. You can sort by a bagel score, spread store. You can sort by neighborhood. You can sort by borough. Basically, any metric that you would want to sort by, you have the ability to do so. So like, oh, I live in Yorkville. How many stores are in Yorkville? Well, I can check that pretty easily. Um, and then if you scroll all the way down on the stats page, uh, you'll see how the boroughs stack up against each other. So this is dynamically updated every time a new uh, review is added. Uh, the tickers will change. You can see that uh, Manhattan uh, takes the lead for average score currently. Uh, when we first launched the site, it was like by the fourth decimal place. That's why it goes that far out. Since uh, the site's launched, it's, it's grown a little bit on the Manhattan side. I would speculate that's because I've probably reviewed more stores on the second pass in Manhattan than other boroughs. And pretty much every store that I've been asked to review has been a positive store because people are passionate about their store. They wouldn't just contact me because they, you know, they have a random store that they'd like me to review. In general, they are good uh, stores. And then this is uh, on the About page. Most of the things about on the About page are things I'm already telling you now. But I did want to call out this thing. This is the 10 bagel axioms. This is kind of my Cliff Notes version of what I learned while I was doing the project. The only one that I'm going to read out here is about toasting, which is obviously a, a hot topic in New York City. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, but from my perspective on toasting, I'm not going to tell anybody how to eat their bagel. You eat it how you want to eat your bagel. What I will say is this, if you're going to a store for the first time, somebody recommended it to you, and you have any anticipation that it's going to be a good bagel, I wouldn't toast it the first time, even if you like to toast your bagel. And why is that? Well, toasting does a couple of things, right? It gives a crunch to the bagel, and it activates the icing, or the cream cheese, to provide like an icing-like texture. These are both great things. These are also great things that a bagel coming out of the oven can do. And if you just leave it as is coming out of the oven, there's all sorts of flavorings that are happening and a different type of crackle that's occurring when you get it out of the oven. If you just toast it away, it's automatically a toasted bagel. You know, toasting, as it says in the second one, it rises the floor potential of a bagel, but it lowers the ceiling potential. So, you know, if you really like bagels, you're just, uh, you're not experiencing potentially a whole universe of just nuance uh, to what's going on. So, yeah, I don't begrudge you if you like toasting bagels, but just maybe not toast it all the time. So we got the last uh, section here. You may have noticed there's uh, an area called mint, 
And uh, minting is not like a, another cream cheese, you know, there's not a mint spread, uh, you know, assessment I did. I don't even know, that would be a terrible bagel probably. Um, but it has to do with the creation of NFTs. And so I mentioned earlier that there's no advertising on the site. Uh, so I did think of another way to potentially finance what was going on. And uh, I'm about to attempt the impossible. I'm about to describe what an NFT is in the middle of a bagel presentation. <laughs> So what's an NFT, right? An NFT stands for non-fungible token. That is a digital asset that is unique and irreplaceable. And as you can see, we immediately know what the problem here is. Fungible is a terrible word. It is a word that I don't like saying. It sounds like fungus. It sounds kind of da uh, damp, soft maybe. It's like hard in the, on the mouth. I don't feel like there's a lot of English words that you even use that frequently. And uh, it's just like not a commonly known word. So it just automatically turns people's brains off. I don't even want to know what that is. But it wasn't a word that was like invented five years ago by uh, tech people. Like it has been around since the 17th century. It has a function. So let's define what fungible means. Replaceable. In this instance, we're talking about something like a dollar or in cryptocurrency terms, Bitcoin or Ethereum. So if I had a dollar bill and I asked somebody in the audience to give me a dollar bill in return, Neither of us would have any gain or loss in value. It's essentially we have exchanged the same thing. It's replaceable. Now, an NFT, in contrast, is unique and irreplaceable. A couple of examples in the art realm, the Mona Lisa, or a house. That is to say, I have a house, and I want to trade you something for my house. There's nothing you can possibly give me that will be exactly the same thing. If you give me another house, it's not the same house. Similarly, if you gave me uh, a, another Mona Lisa, if I have the original one, you're not giving me the same thing. At the best, you're giving me a copy of what it is. So NFTs are the next step in creating functional uses for cryptocurrency. That is to say, creating, being able to trade a fungible digital asset for a non-fungible digital asset. This completes the loop. It basically creates an ecosystem where cryptocurrency can be relevant. Smart contracts are the things that dispense NFTs under pre-programmed conditions. And uh, I used the gumball machine example. I picked the scariest gumball machine I could possibly find. Um, I would not let my child near that. That seems like it's a, you know it could crush them. Uh, but if you think about a gumball machine, right? The idea there is that somebody made that gumball machine and said that only a quarter would make it so that it would dispense the token, and then you get the thing. Similarly, a programmer can make a smart contract such that I have one Ethereum, I put that Ethereum into the contract, and then an NFT is spit out to that particular person. So the blockchain, the last definition I'm going to do today, that is a transaction ledger. That is something that is not maintained by anyone. Once it's been set up, it is up permanently, and it will track who purchased that NFT, who owns that NFT at any time, if it's traded from one person to another. You can de define uniquely who owns that particular asset. So that is what NFTs are. Why? Why is it that I wanted to do NFTs? Well, there's a few reasons, right? An existing community. So in May of 2020, as the walking project was ending, I got invited to make some art for an NFT project called Blipmap. And when I did that, I ended up doing the four food groups of New York, the pizza, the hot dog, the bagel, and the pretzel. Because my idea was I wanted to tie in the walking that I was doing with the NFT thing. Much in the same way, I wanted to tie the NFT thing in with the bagel reviews that I was doing. So it's an amazing community of people, really smart people, really creative people. And uh, I knew that there was potentially an, uh, an interest to collect the things that I was uh, making. In addition to that, it was a project funding fit, right? So we have kind of a built-in base, but it also made more sense to me as far as like creating something that could potentially finance the site. You know, you think about what the alternatives might be, like uh, shirts, for instance. Well, with a shirt, uh, there is like a degree of like production cost and there's uh, a high chance of wastefulness. Anything that you're making that's physical, and as I said at the start of the talk, I've done all sorts of different creative mediums. I have DVDs in my closet from a feature film I made in 2008. I'm never getting rid of those. Those are like, you know, 
and I'm not, I don't know, I would have to, first of all, be motivated to sell them again. But if I was, then I'd have to meet you somewhere to like sell you a $10 DVD. You'd have to have a DVD player. None of this makes sense. You know, so with the NFTs, there's no maintenance for the asset. There's no storage required for the asset. Uh, it's up perpetually. I don't have to go to a conference to you know, sell a few shirts. Like, it just, it makes sense for me as far as how I wanna be uh, selling products. It's also the medium for me. And by that I mean, as I mentioned, I've, I've done m music, I've done movies, video games, written word. All of those things, aside from the fact that they're in my closet, you uh, probably won't see them, most likely. Even if you really liked the things I was doing, it'd be very hard to track them down. You'd have to have both the motivation and uh, the wherewithal to, to get access to those things. And because uh, I've been a creator that has jumped around to where I've been inspired from one inspiration to the next, there isn't quite a through line to everything I've done. You know, one day I might be making video games, the next day I might be walking 7,000 miles. So with this, with NFTs, there's kind of a potential here. There's a through line I can see. Where in five years from now, if I'm documenting what I'm doing in this medium, and everything I just said from this point, you know, the music, the games, et cetera, they can all be comfortably couched inside this medium. I can potentially create an oeuvre where like previously none has existed. So that's really compelling to me, to be able to think that I can uh, not have to maintain any of these things physically as well as create something that is easily pointable back, you know, moving forward. And then the final thing, the thing that really like uh, crystallized it for me, why I wanted to do this, it's the future of reviews, or just a, a kind of a reflection on what the future of reviews could be. Let's take a look at what the current review um, status is, right? Web 2, so to speak. We have Yelp, we have Google, very popular review aggregators, you know? Uh, I had never used, uh, or had never provided a review to either of those platforms until just a couple months ago, after I had released the website. A uh, buddy's bar of mine opened up and I gave it a five-star review because it's a good bar, but he's also my friend. And uh, I was shocked at the level of positive affirmation I got from Google about that one action. I got emails every third day. Your review is doing great. 16 people saw it today. It's amazing. You should do more reviews. You're like, let's help build this community together. You, are, you can be like a real beacon for this, for this city, you know? And the most you get out of that is a user score. You get a little clicker next to your name. Maybe if you do it 100 times, you're a city guide. You get a little crown next to your name, something like that. Maybe if you do it 1,000 times, maybe you can go to a Time Out New York and say, hey, look, I've done this so many times. Can you, can you please like, maybe give me a little column where I can do that? And then, after all that, you can actually start converting your effort into something that makes sense. With NFTs, you could potentially just totally undercut that whole thing. You can come up with something that's kind of quirky and subjective, like all the bagels in New York City, or the best sushi in San Francisco, or the best deep dish pizza in Chicago. Come up with a website, you know, take nice photos, put some thought into the reviews. People can use that site, and then if they like it, they can support it in the same way that you would buy a screen print from an artist. Now that seems to make a lot more sense to me in terms of rewarding people's labor and like making it motivating to actually provide uh, reviews. I mean, as much as I like getting fluffed by Google, like I don't, I would prefer to actually do something that, you know, I can exchange value on immediately and support myself so that I can continue to do things that are cool and interesting. I don't think what I'm doing is like the end all version of what this will be, but I can see a future where a Yelp-esque platform emerges where you provide a review and you have the option if you want to tokenize that review, make it an NFT, and if you're an influencer, you could potentially sell it that way, or if you're just somebody that's really good at doing this one thing, you can build up a following without having to build a whole scaffolding for it like I did. Okay, so. We have all the data, we have the site, we have the NFT project set up. Reception, how'd the reception go? So uh, Jesse, uh, wonderfully, helped me do uh, outreach for the project. So we, did a, we put it together in email, and we did outreach to 17 
different outlets. We only heard back from one, and that was Time Out New York. And Time Out New York ended up being the thing that seeded everything else. We didn't have to do any more outreach after that. And that was something that was completely unprecedented in anything I've ever done. It was amazing. You know, usually it's just like, please, sir, please, will you review my thing? Thank you. Thank you so much. And you'll get like one or two things. Most of them go to spam. Uh, you know, I found out later some people that we had contacted about the project a year prior, where we were in discussions about the bagel thing. They were like, oh, yeah, I, I just found, I was looking for our current email, and I found one that you sent me a year ago. It went right to my trash. Like, you know, so it, it's crazy. I, I mean, I'm sure there are better people than I that know how to, like, navigate these things. But it was cool to actually have something that people were excited to engage in. And I think it's because, you know, it, it wrote itself. You know, a, a couple walked 7,000 miles in search of the perfect bagel. I mean, that isn't why we were doing the 7,000 mile walk, but it, like, it, it made sense, you know. And they got married at the end. Isn't that amazing, you know? It's, you know, New York City and bagels. It's got a, a couple. It's, it's got everything. So it ended up being, we were on Fox. We were on New York One. We were, did uh, NBC local. We went to the number one spot in the city and did a remote thing. And then it just started rolling from there. I mean, we were in the New York Times. We were on NPR. We were in the Washington Post. They took all the data and they like did their own data set based on that. Uh, and then uh, ultimately we were on the Today Show. And uh, it was great. Al Roker was super cool. They were actually doing a thing that was more walk focused, which was great because Part of the reason that I wanted to lead with the bagel thing was what I hoped it would bring some shine to the walking thing, and it did. They were doing this thing called Start Today, which was like an, uh, a month-long initiative to get people up and moving. It's a really great initiative, actually. I ended up joining their Facebook group, and it's all just like people gushing over how great each other's doing. Um, but um, it, uh, yeah, it was just a great opportunity for both myself and Jesse to kind of like learn about what it is to engage with media, to learn how much it's like work. I mean, each one of these things, it's like constant scheduling back and forth, uh, getting them assets to make the stuff, preparing yourself for the interviews, like it's, it's a job. Uh, but it's a, it's a cool one and uh, I'm super excited about it. And uh, yeah, we managed to like have a whole other bunch of different local publications too. So um, Cafe Ann, uh, by the way, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Cafe Ann, I would really check that out, it's a really cool one. Um, but yeah, uh, it, was, it was beyond our expectations. It was within our hopes, and it uh, ended up being excellent. As far, oh, I forgot about this one. So also there's emails, right? Um, uniformly positive, like 96% of the emails we get, I love this project, here's a store suggestion, thank you so much, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to call out one bad one and one good one. The bad one, um, was a store owner, uh, they might be in the audience, they might be here, I don't know. Um, if you're in the audience, you can stand up and yell at me. We could have an interesting debate. Um, this store owner, uh, they own a, a, a small chain, but they also do distribution to a number of stores, which is obviously a very common thing. Um, they led by being like, do you know that like uh, bagel stores supply other stores? Obviously I do. I'm here to review a store that has bagel in the name. That's pretty much my goal. If you do that, then I'm going to evaluate how the bagels are. Um, but he just got in. He, the person really couldn't uh, grok the idea that the bagels that they supply everywhere might be different from store to store. Not, I mean, ignoring the fact that like the cream cheese in the store are different, but also the bagels might be stored differently. They might just be handling things differently. Um, but then he, would, he was accusing me of like swapping out the bagels to take less flattering pictures and uh, ultimately uh, decided to uh, claim that I was being paid by some sort of big bagel entity. That this whole thing had been a scheme, an 18 month long scheme to, uh, I guess, thwart him and instead reward a hole in the wall Queens bagel shop. Like, I, I mean, I would even if like it was big bagel, like probably like Essa bagel would be number one or like something like that, right? Not like this obscure, you know, local spot. Um, so, I mean, if it isn't abundantly clear for the record, I was not paid by anybody to do this in advance. I was not retroactively paid after to bump something or whatnot. I, I'm just a man that's crazy and decided for 18 months to eat <laughs> bagels and then create a website. Um, and then as far as a good, uh, a good uh, email, one of my favorites is Looking for the Perfect Bagel by Stanley Schwartz. 
that was sent to me by Stanley's wife. Uh, it is a folk song that is exactly what it sounds like. It is a guy s just singing again and again, looking for the perfect bagel. Uh, it's on YouTube. I would recommend listening to it just because of how silly it is. And uh, if anybody's going to sing me or send me a song about bagels, I will promote it. That's just my flat rule. If you uh, write a bagel song, I will talk about it to someone. Uh, as far as the NFT side of things, so the NFT project launched at the same time as the website. Uh, to this point, we've had 151 of 202 minted. Uh, that um, was like, I'd say like 60% were minted uh, right like in the first week. And then the rest have been like, um, you know, people that are interested about NFTs or have like picked it up from the uh, coverage uh, on the various media. Um, it's 0.1 ETH per bagel. Uh, there are two best and burrows left in the pool. So the way that it works is you mint one and then you get a random one, much like you know, a gumball machine. And so the best in city is still out there and the uh, best in Bronx I think is still out there, as well as a number of stores that have received awards. And you know, of course all of them are interesting as far as I'm concerned. Um, and what you get is a picture of the bagel, the actual review in the NFT, and then like all the metadata of the NFT itself. So like where the store score was from zero to five, if it had an award, all of that is injected into the actual NFT. And it makes for really cool, like, again, if you're like a data person like I am, like if you remember like iTunes back in like the early 2000s when like, you know, you might, if you weren't this person, you probably knew people. I was one of these people that like tracked all of their albums, made sure that the genre was right, the album was right, the year it came out was right. It's that same like kind of OCD satisfaction that you get, that you can actually like track perpetually within the NFT. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to end with this. This is the number one store, PNC Bagels or Hot Bagels in Middle Village, Queens. That's Linda, she's a sweetheart. Uh, PNC actually catered our wedding that I mentioned at the top. Uh, I told her, this was before the site came out. You can actually see the printout of our review. They put it in this like boar's head uh, thing. It's really, it's hilarious. And they taped over the boar's head signage with masking tape. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah, we, they, they catered our wedding. Uh, when I came and asked them to do that, I was like, by the way, you're the number one store. This was before the website came out. And she was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, she had no idea. Uh, but when it did come out, it, um, people flocked to their shop. You know, they were getting people from Connecticut, Jersey, uh, traveling distances to come to their bagel store. The pandemic had been really tough for them. So, you know, they just can't be thankful enough about uh, getting this review, which is in turn extremely gratifying. Um, their store, this, this photo, neither of these photos do a good job like servicing it. I mean, the, the, the exterior windows I love, but um, there's all sports memorabilia up in the store from like local teams. They have every, um, every uh, fridge has a baseball bat zip tied to the handle. And I asked them, like, so it like goes with the theme. And I asked them why they do that. And they're just like, you know, one of our customers thought of it one day, so we just let them do it. Like, it's just like everything about it is this like chaotic aesthetic, yet like somehow it all falls into place perfectly. So I, I love them. I think they're a great, I think they're a great store. That's the picture of their bagel. And, um, but there's a reason it's, it's number one. And it, it, I mean, it's partial, all the sum of the things I just said, but it's also a little bit more than that because it made me realize something about the project as a whole. I'm not from Middle Village. I've never, I've never seen this store before, but my mom is from Middle Village. My dad's from Middle Village. My cousins live in Middle Village. My brother moved into my mom's old house and lived there for like 15 years. Um, my dad is buried across the street from this spot. So I was eating this bagel. I'm sitting here on the parking thing. I'm like, you know, carefully balancing myself. And, uh, and I'm thinking about all of this. And as I'm eating it, I'm transcending the actual eating experience and I'm having just a realization about what bagels are in general. And what bagels are in general to me are comfort. You know, it is, it is the New York City comfort food. It is family. It is the bagel store where you grew up. It is the bagel store near your first apartment. 
It is the bagel store where they know your order and your name. It is, you know, hungover Sunday mornings. It is, I don't want to cook for my kids, so I'm going to get a bagel quickly. It's, it fills all these needs. It's, it's bread. It is essential food. And to the, because it's so essential, it can tie in the family so easily. And it was that that actually made me give this store the only five bagel out of the entire project. Uh, because, it, again, it transcended just the actual eating experience. It made me realize something about what it is exactly that I was doing. And I was totally open to having that review supplanted, but it just never happened. It became like the, the spot where I was like, wow, you know, like maybe one day, you know, I'm going to come back with my nephews and nieces and like we'll get a bagel and then we'll go see where my dad's buried. Like it, it just all clicked what the actual meaning of this food was. And that's why I was number one. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions if people have any questions regarding anything. Who minted the Middle Village one? The Middle Village one has not been minted yet. It's still out in the world. Yeah, you can, yeah, I mean, you can, you, yeah, I mean, go. There's only 50 of them left, so it's possible. Uh, yeah. Was there like a time period that you would set that you have to eat the bacon after you got it? Like you couldn't go home an hour and eat it? Oh, I would never do that. I would never, the most I would ever carry a bagel would be like 10 minutes maybe, uh, just to find a part, place to sit. Um, but no, no, I mean, that doesn't do a service. And that's not how functionally I would eat a bagel most times, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, people did give me some flack. Again, it, you know, overwhelmingly positive response, but in general, like, you get some flack. Um, the flack I got uh, was like, why didn't you go at a consistent time? And see, that I didn't feel as, like, beholden to, because I don't go to a bagel store at a consistent time. Uh, and, and in fact, generally, they were like, why don't you go at, like, 6.30? And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, those are when good bagels are, most usually. But, like, I like to go at 1. And if I can go to a store at 1 that has fresh bagels, and they do exist, then I want to know about that if I'm a consumer. You know, like, I want to be able to say, like, I can go there and get a bagel. Um, so it didn't, that wasn't as important to me. But, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, uh, getting it uh, eaten right away was important to me. Yes. When and how it's spread. Yeah, sure. Uh, so by and large, what I would, in an ideal situation, the, the radiant heat of the bagel activates the cream cheese such that it takes on a more icing-like uh, quality. So it's a little sloppy. Another revelation that I had while eating the number one bagel that I didn't call out was something that's in the bagel axioms, and that is bagels are the barbecue of breakfast. And by that, I mean the best bagels, when the cream cheese is activated, just r have this knife's edge of like, oh, this is really messy. I don't want to deal with it, but it's so good. Maybe I can just fold the bagel a little bit and I can get the cream cheese. All right, good. That's a good bite. You know, like basically riding that edge of like too messy to bear, but too delicious to stop. So that's really where I would like to go. There, like, there are some rare exceptions where a cold cream cheese can work, and I call it out when it does happen. Uh, but by and large, um, it, you, cold usually means clumpy, and clumpy is not desirable for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about the exotic like uh, a period? So uh, I mean. So for the purposes of this uh, exercise, I always had an everything with scallion cream cheese to create like a control. But in general, um, Liberty Bagels does some great stuff with cream cheese. I had a birthday cake cream cheese there the other day. Uh, that's great. They also have, I haven't tried it yet, they have a cheeseburger cream cheese uh, that he is like, you close your eyes, you swear you're eating a cheeseburger. And it's like, but I have to close my eyes, right? And, you know, <laughs> so. Um, so uh, I'll give it a shot, but usually, like, I'm also the type of person that I'm, uh, I get a vanilla milkshake, I always get the same, even like, even after this has been over, and people like take me out for bagels like they take you out for a beer or a coffee, um, I still get the same thing most of the time. Uh, and then as far, yeah, I mean like French toast bagels, uh, you know, I like, I don't think there's like, uh, I don't really like see like the crazy exotic ones and think immediately to go for it. But of course, if like somebody were to give it to me, like if I were at a store, of course I'd try it and I'd probably like it. My brain just doesn't go there, you know, generally.
Yeah. I got bagels and smear. Ooh, bagels and smear. That's fourteen and a half. Nice, nice. That's a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the live man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That one has uh, an amazing toaster. Yeah, like it, you go there and the, the order flow is pretty good. It's like a long, narrow store because it's a lot of uh, Manhattan stores are. And um, it has like a vertical toaster. And like you can see, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a cage fight ca like thing. It's like it look, it just like, it look, it's this very weird way that it like brings it up and then drops it down. I've never seen another toaster like it. But that's, I mean, uh, you know, the reason that I can even remember something like that is something that I find interesting. I had never, I don't know if any of you have, I don't know if you journal or anything. I, I did a journal entry at the end of every day that we walked and I've done journaling on and off throughout my life as like need or interest dictates. But I've never stopped in the middle of the day to be like, what is it that I'm thinking and feeling right now? And like even more narrowly about this experience, about the bagel. And it is wild how much of like a memory fastener that is. Like pretty much any time I read the reviews, I am like teleported back to that experience. It's pretty wild. I didn't know that the memory could operate that way. And uh, you know, I, it took me a second to, to think about bagels and smear, but then I was like, yeah, I know that one. I did it after the project, uh, the walk was over, but before the site was launched and it had this weird ass toasting contraption, you know? And uh, that's all because like I spent time to like think about, you know, it and write it down. Yeah. Did you try a toasted bagel there after your toasted bagel? No, I did not try a toasted bagel there. <laughs> yeah. But I should maybe, you know. Yeah. Uh, do you dare to expand into Nassau and Suffolk County? Uh, people have asked if I should do that. I mean, uh, probably not, you know. <laughs> I'd because uh, I'd have to walk like two marathons, you know. Like I'm, I, it's just it's a, it's. I know this sounds absurd, but it's, it's taxing on the body to eat all these bagels. I mean, none of the bagel stores like when I say this, and Sam Silverman does not like when I say this, because it's like, you know, we're trying to build a brand here. But like, I ate three bagels a week, and I ate three bagels a week because I walked five marathons a week. Like, it's not, you know, bagels are like sometimes food. You know, like the Cookie Monster, cookies are sometimes food. You know, like, it just, it's, it hits me hard. Uh, but I love them, obviously. So like, to make this my whole life, like, I really would have to like, okay, well, what's my physical regimen to like do this? Cause uh, I'm not driving out there eating a bagel and coming home, you know? Um, yeah, all right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, there are some stickers here if you wanna grab one. Uh, feel free to come up and talk to me. Feel free to message me on all the various socials and uh, I appreciate all you being here. Thank you.